Dear colleagues, in this short video I will discuss the two basic features of a nodule, the composition and the action density. The composition of a lesion refers to the lack or presence of cystic and solid portions and the ratio of them. The accuracy does to the grayscale level of the solid part of an anatomical structure. By the way, these are not only those features that are first encountered when a nodule is detected during an ultrasound examination. These two properties are the basis for the decision on the further management of the patient and are the two of the three basic features on which all thyroid classifications are based on. The third one encounters the suspicious ultrasound characteristics. First, the categorization of the cystic lesions. The first task when we see cystic areas within a discrete lesion is to judge the ratio between solid and cystic parts. As a rule, if the solid parts prevail, then the nodule should be classified as solid or dominantly solid depending on the proportion of cystic content. If the cystic areas exceed that of the solid parts, then the lesion is a cystic one. Move to the third row. Most guidelines do not mention a very important consideration. A purely cystic lesion less than 1 cm in maximal diameter is a normal finding in a healthy thyroid. These lesions correspond to dilated macrofolliculus and the term nodule for such areas should be avoided. Otherwise, we create thyroid patients from almost every human being. So, there are cystic areas and cystic nodules. The latter are divided according to the proportion of the cystic content. If it exceeds 90%, then most guidelines use the term cystic nodule, but if the cystic content is between 50 and 90%, they classify the nodule as predominantly cystic. Let's turn to the lowest row. The point of distinguishing between cystic and predominantly cystic nodules is that malignancy is very rare in the former. The three practically almost always benign forms are the pure, the almost pure cysts and the spongiform type cysts. If a nodule is predominantly cystic, it is worth making distinction whether the nodule is peripheral or central type. Most malignant cystic nodules belong to the peripheral subtype. In this table I summarize the classification of nodules according to the possible combination of cystic and solid content. Let's see some examples of the different subtypes. The left thyroid presents numerous tiny cystic areas. These are less than 1 cm in maximal diameter and do not show solid parts. These correspond to dilated macrofolliculus. If we compare them with the nodule in the right images, the only difference is in the size of the lesions. The right case proved to be a pure cyst because after the aspiration of the fluid, the lesion has completely disappeared. This table refers to the basic terminology. Although the left upper nodule shows tiny cystic areas, the sum of these areas is surely below 5%, therefore this nodule should be classified as a solid nodule. In the left lower case, the solid parts exceed that of cystic areas, however the amount of the latter is above 10%, therefore this nodule should be considered as a predominantly solid nodule. In the right cases, the amount of fluid exceeds that of solid portions. In the right upper case, the cystic content is between 50 and 90%, therefore this is a predominantly cystic nodule, By the right lower image is an almost completely cystic nodule because the fluid content is larger than 90%. The distinction between a pure cyst and an almost completely cystic nodule is not always possible and not all guidelines deal with this issue. Only one consideration. A fully anechoic pattern is very rarely seen. A non-anechoic portion is not equivalent with the solid part because it may represent either a fibrin clot or fluid with high protein content left image or a fibrotic bundle right image. 
A spongiform pattern is not a rare finding, but it is a true spongiform cyst. We call a pattern spongiform if it contains small cystic chambers divided by fibrous septa and does not present solid portions. A spongiform nodule is classified differently in various guidelines. Some guidelines are content with the proportion of spongiform parts exceeding 50%, while, for example, the ETA speaks of a spongiform nodule if the entire region is composed of spongiform areas. The case on the left is by no means a spongiform nodule, as we see spongiform areas in a very small part of the lesion. Although small cystic chambers can be seen in most parts of the nodule, in contrast with the spongiform pattern, they are mixed with a solid part. In the right cases, the spongiform areas exceed 50% of the nodule, therefore these lesions can be classified as spongiform nodules in all but the European Thyroid Association guideline. The final distinction relies on the appearance of the solid proportion within a mixed, predominantly cystic nodule. If the solid part can be followed all along the inner surface of the nodule, then the nodule should be classified as a central type lesion. We meet this subtype in follicular adenomas. A peripheral subtype means that the solid part bulges or projects into the cystic cavity. The peripheral type is typical both of benign hyperplastic nodules and of papillary cancers. Let's turn to the echogenicity. This feature is the most important characteristic of a thyroid nodule, which in great proportion of cases decides itself the next step in the evaluation of thyroid patients. The difference in echogenicity is based on visual judgment on grayscale levels. Therefore, it is crucial to watch this lecture in a dark room and on a proper monitor, similarly to a rearward ultrasound examination, which should be performed in dark room. Although, similarly to most other ultrasound characteristics, we have no biological standard which the echogenicity can be compared to, at first sight, the interpretation of echogenicity does not seem to be a very difficult task. We have two reference tissues. The more important is the normal thyroid. If a nodule is more or similarly echogenic to the normal thyroid, then it belongs to the iso hyperechoic subgroup. If the nodule is darker than the normal thyroid, the nodule is hypochoic. The other distinction is based on the comparison to the strap muscle in the event of hypochoic nodules. If a hypochoic nodule is less dark than the strap muscle, then it should be considered as minimally moderately hypochoic. If the lesion is darker than the strap muscle, the nodule is deeply or very hypochoic. So, theoretically, it seems to be a very simple task to determine the echogenicity of the nodule. Although, traditionally, we distinct five different kinds of nodules according to their echogenicity, all guidelines speak of only three different types because hyperechoic and isoechoic nodules are treated in the same way as are minimally and moderately hypochoic lesions. Although all guidelines suggest differentiation non-deeply and deeply hypochoic nodules, regarding the scoring systems they differ. Two of them, the ATA and current turrets, handle all hypochoic nodules in the same way, while the other systems do not. Let's see some examples. The overall echogenicity of the left upper nodule is similar to the non-nodular part. So this is an isoechoic region. The left lower nodule is brighter compared to the surrounding non-nodular tissue. Therefore, this is a hyperechoic region. Both right nodules are hyperechoic because they are darker than the extranodular thyroid. Compared to the strap muscle running ventral to the thyroid, the upper nodule is brighter while the lower is a bit darker. So the upper lesion must be regarded as minimally moderately hypochoic while the lower one 
as a deeply or very hyperreflection. Finally, I present a case. The right loop has a large nodule. The cystic content clearly exceeds 50%, but it is less than 90%. A thin, economical solid parenchyma runs all along the inner wall of the nodule. So this is a peripheral type, predominantly cystic nodule. We had to reset the depths in order to visualize the dorsal part of the lobe. The cystic content of the largest nodule in the left lobe clearly exceeds 95%, so this is an almost completely cystic nodule. We can see a characteristic phenomenon, the acoustic amplification dorsal to the cyst. That is, the thyroid dorsal to the cyst is lighter compared to other parts.